it's a full Scottish. This is Sunday the 12th of December. I'm Hugh Stewart. Now in today's programme for the next hour we're going to discuss some of the big items in the news. We have a lot to talk about today and to help me we have two guests. First of all can I introduce you up in Aberdeen to Professor Marilla Delabegovic and good afternoon. Are you hearing good us loud and clear? Marilla? Hi, and good to have you joining us. And over in the west end of Glasgow, we have Cockup Stewart, member of the Scottish Parliament. Good afternoon, Cockup. How are you? Good afternoon. Hi. I'm well, thanks. That's good. So we can see and hear everybody. Thanks. So we're going to be discussing the news in just a few minutes, but I'll begin with the latest COVID briefing from the Scottish Government. So from 2 p.m. Saturday, we have these figures. 4,087 new cases were reported of COVID-19. 12 new reported deaths of people who had tested positive. So far, 4,361,197 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination and 3,971,488 have received their second dose. Also now, 2,076,084 people have received a third dose, the booster. 552 people were in hospital who had recently uh, confirmed COVID-19 and 33 of those were in intensive care. Since the start of the pandemic, a total of 761,900 people in Scotland have tested positive for COVID-19, while 9,719 who have tested positive have now sadly died. So those were the up-to-date figures as of yesterday. Uh, they're released at two o'clock, of course, so we won't have today's figures until tomorrow's uh, show in the evening. Um, OK, so good uh, afternoon again. Uh, I was about to say good evening. I'm not used to uh, being up this early on a Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. Um, so um, let's just move on from that to looking at the latest news on the Omicron variant. We reported, of course, on Friday that the First Minister stressed that we were very concerned about the rate of spread of the new variant, and it certainly seems to be the case that, that it spreads, it doubles something like uh, between two and, two and three days. Um, so let's look at what we know. Can I ask you, first of all, Morella, um, we know then that the rate of spread is rapid. Uh, what we don't know yet is, well, there are two other questions. There's how serious is it if you actually get it? Do we really know that yet? And if you don't mind, uh, the other question is, um, how effective are the are the vaccines against it? What do we know so far? Yeah, so I mean, the next two or three weeks are going to be crucial to really understand what is going on in regards to Omicron. As you just pointed out, we know that the new set of mutations is, is deemed to be more dangerous because they are in the part of the virus that our vaccines are currently working against. Um, it seems to be more transmissible. Um, however, there is anecdotal evidence to suggest that it may not be as uh, severe. We don't know that yet. Uh, we will know the data from in about two or three weeks, as I say, as we see how well the patients who are currently diagnosed having the mutation are recovering over time. Um, I think this is really important to stress here how important vaccinations are. So we know the vaccines do protect us. We don't know quite how well at the moment in regards to um, you know the vaccines that we currently have, but we know that we should all be getting boosters. Uh, from again anecdotal evidence of, of many colleagues and friends I've had recently developed COVID uh, who have been vaccinated, their symptoms were much milder. So I, I I know that for sure I'm going for my booster next week. And this is what we have to bear in mind, that we should really try and be trying to uh, encourage as many people as possible to get those vaccines. Only vaccines will get us out of here. In regards to, as I say, how what do we know about the virus itself? We, as you said, um, the transmissibility is definitely increased in comparison to the other mutations. However, we don't know as yet how it affects us, and we will know those data soon. Okay, so it's unwise really to um, to be falsely optimistic. Maybe we should be, but yeah, a lot of people have been saying, well, perhaps as new variants come out, they're going to spread very quickly, but perhaps they're not going to kill the host. That's the, the basis of our wishful thinking. But you're saying that's really just a suggestion. We really cannot say that's true at the moment. 
Well, what we don't know is, is exactly with each mutation is how dangerous it is to, in comparison to the other ones. But what we do know is by not being vaccinated, we are allowing these mutations to, to happen. So, um, you know, we have an excellent uh, vaccination rate in this country, obviously, and it could be better because uh, at the moment, the lowest vaccination rates are really in the area of 20 to 40. Um, uh, so we need people who are age 20 or 40 to be more likely to go and get vaccinated. But if we don't get vaccinated, we will allow those mutations to occur. OK, so one thing we do know, yeah, people are hoping maybe this is less effective, uh, less serious. But uh, we do know it's less serious if you have triple vaccinations. So even if you do catch yes. it, yeah, the more vaccinated you are, the more likely you are to come out uh, reasonably healthy. Now, Cocker, let's move on to the Scottish Government response. We hear today that social care staff are being urged to get the booster. Um, so is the Scottish Government now saying that um, regardless of age groups, anyone who's working in that sector is now eligible and should go and make an appointment to get a booster as soon as possible? I think... Um... I think that that would be sensible um, because we know that sort of um, the effect on the workforce um, can be quite devastating. Um, so it's trying to protect as many people as possible. And one of the ways that uh, we can make sure that the NHS um, is able to cope is by making sure that we do have uh, a vaccinated uh, workforce. So I would urge everybody that's in health and social care to go and get the vaccine vaccinations and get their boosters if they're eligible for that as well. Yes, we've, we've just received this today from the Scottish Government. Uh, Health Secretary Hamza Youssef says that um, financial support may be available. If any, any care workers need to take time off work to go and get uh, the booster, then there is financial help for that. Um, he also stresses that uptakes of the booster are currently around 48% for social care workers and uh, 54 or 55% for care home staff. Um, so there certainly is room for more people in that sector to get uh, get the third booster and they're advised to do so and given help to do so. Um, so um, Yeah, that's... absolutely. And I think that that's part of our job um, as a Scottish government to make sure that our messaging is very clear and we use all our different platforms uh, to make sure that we reach as many people as possible and give them the information that they need in order to make um, a decision that's informed. OK, so that's a public health measure and there's no ambiguity and no confusion there. Get the third booster as soon as you're eligible and anyone working in care, yes, you are eligible. So uh, make an appointment and go and get it and help is available. Uh, so that's quite clear. Um, the other thing that was made clear the other day by the First Minister is that we have to be very careful with our own mitigation. So obviously we, we still wear masks. I came up on the bus today, everyone was wearing a mask on the bus. Um, and we've also got to continue to uh, wash hands, wash surfaces. And the other thing that was brought in is that uh, we may need to isolate. If you're unfortunate enough to be with somebody who is declared positive, then um, uh, anyone in contact with that person has to, um, has to also isolate. So that is a, a tightening of the measures. And the other measure that was announced, it's not really a measure, it's advice to get tested. If you are going to a meeting, social meeting or work, get tested every day. And we're doing that here in Broadcasting Scotland. The team here has all uh, confirmed a negative test before we came into the studio. Um, so is that a, a tightening up? Uh, Mirella, do you think there's, is there um, a likelihood that we are going to get a tightening up of the, of the mitigation measures in the next few weeks? Yeah, I mean, some of the changes are obviously in regards to isolation rules. Uh, I know that within schools in Aberdeen, we have got emails about children who are now um, part of that kind of group that, that, that the children will have to self-isolate for 10 days. Um, in regards to you know um, us being in Scotland, I think we've been pretty good so far anyway at wearing masks everywhere. I, I've not been to a single occasion where we weren't wearing masks, to be honest. And uh, at least within the university settings, we have been testing at least twice uh, a week before going into work. Uh, so I think it's kind of just kind of following the normal measures that we think are um, you know reasonable. I think we should all be taking lateral flow tests, especially if you're going to be surrounded by other people it's just about common sense you know possibly not going into crowded areas if we don't have to um i know that certainly i'm 
taking those precautions. Uh, and I think going forward, this is what we'll need to do. Um, I think in a population that is well vaccinated, we should be just following the, the good measures and hopefully we will be avoiding any lockdown measures that obviously would affect mental health of our elderly population as well as our young um, adults in schools. So hopefully we won't need to go into that space yet. Okay, so uh, tightening up of mitigation, but uh, well, if that works, um, then we might not need to take any further measures. We will, of course, hear uh, Colcub on Tuesday. Uh, the Scottish Parliament is going to have an update. Um, so, are you expecting um, really uh, a continuous of public continuation of the public health message? Um, I'm just advising people to be very careful with the mitigations, or are you expecting any new measures? to be announced on Tuesday? No, um, I mean, to be honest, at the moment, um, I really couldn't say. Um, it's quite clear to me over the last few days um, and going forward that this is a rapidly changing situation. Um, and the First Minister was able, I think, to uh, explain quite uh, carefully how um, Omicron is um, sort of like, you know, increasing so rapidly um, and the level of infection. So obviously the scientists have done all their modeling on that. And I think that it is sensible, um, even though I totally understand that it is so frustrating for everybody at this stage. Um, but nevertheless, if we can uh, tighten up on our own behaviors um, at this moment in time and uptake uh, the boosters and the vaccines, uh, do all of that, then I hope that uh, nothing more severe can come and we can get through this. Yeah, again, it's a public health message. Now, you've both talked about testing. Before we move on to the next topic, um, Marella, we hear today that there is a new test. Well, you've been working at the University of Aberdeen for about a year on a new test which uses artificial intelligence to, um, to seek uh, COVID. And the new test is actually 99% effective. That sounds remarkable. Will the new test uh, be able to detect any variant of COVID from here on? So yeah, this is the new antibody test we developed. And I should say we developed this at the start of the pandemic when the Scottish government announced a rapid response in COVID research call to all the universities in Scotland. And ours was one of the projects that was funded immediately. So we reopened our labs one month into the pandemic. Uh, so what we have been able to develop is a, is a new technology whereby we can really detect antibodies against COVID-19. And one thing that's really important to stress here is that as we kind of go through different mutations, the antibody tests that are currently available have not been able to keep up with the sensitivity. So every new mutation will kind of abolish that response. So if you're testing, if you've got antibody against COVID or you want to know how well your vaccine has worked, it may be that you may not be able to detect those antibodies. It's not that you don't have them, it's just that the test is not sensitive enough anymore. So what we were able to do at the University of Aberdeen in collaboration with a pharmaceutical, well, a small, a small medium enterprise, uh, Versus Antibodies Limited, and our colleagues in the NHS, Grampian and Tayside, is develop a test that doesn't lose sensitivity over time. And the way we do this, every time there is a new mutation, we add those mutations into the test, and it takes about three to four days to do this. So that when you're testing how well you're protected, you can actually get the real-time information of the kind of population-wide immunity. And we developed it through the Scottish Government's funding and Chief Scientist Office to make it available to the healthcare. So the test is affordable. It is um, cheaper than any other test currently um, available. And the idea is also to try and help the low and middle income countries to distribute these tests in those countries, because those are the countries which don't have access to the vaccines like we do. And they may need to make really difficult decisions of who would be prioritized first. So, yeah, in essence, yes, we have developed a test that appears excellent. And the next test, so this is now fine, um, completed the final uh, approvals from uh, NIABSC, which is the government agency for approval of all new tests. And we have another test in the final round of approvals, which is going to tell us uh, the natural immunity versus from natural infection versus vaccine-induced immunity. And this is really important because, A, we need to know how well um, the 
COVID-19 has gone through the population, how well the vaccines are protecting us, uh, but also kind of going forward, how often should we need to get boosters? Because it, it may be that I need to get it every six months, but maybe your immune system is better and you have more antibodies and you may need it only once a year, etc. Well, this seems like really exciting news to me. So um, at the moment, the stage is that it's, um, it's been tested in the labs, if you like, but it's not yet fully rolled out. So um, who rolls it out? Is it the UK government? And um, how do we make that an international response? Uh, do you work through the WHO or European Union yeah, so or ECDC? So that's a, that's a great question. And the idea is in the summer when we announced that we developed the test, it was for research use only. And then it needed to pass two phases of approvals by um, National Institute for Biological Standards and Control. So this is the government agency, as I say, and it's finally been completed. So now it can actually go into distribution. So we are at the moment speaking to several companies about um, distributing these tests worldwide. We are also uh, we have applied to be part of a project through WHO as well for international standards across um, um, different countries. So there are lots of things going on at the moment, and one of the things we are also trying to do is make it more into a lateral flow test so they can be used for a point of care. It only uses one drop of blood so it's incredibly sensitive and the idea would be that you could take it at home so just like you take your lateral flow test now before you go somewhere to know if you're positive or negative, the idea would be to take a lateral flow test to see how many antibodies you've got whether you're protected or not and it's important to, to say that in some countries when you travel to those countries they don't just take your vaccination uh, record, but they actually check your antibodies um, because just because you've been vaccinated, it's not kind of good enough proof um, that you are actually protected. So there are lots of ways forward. And as I say, we needed this final approval to, in order to actually roll it out now. OK, so that's the news of an, an excellent new test developed at the University of Aberdeen, but in partnership with businesses and um, all funded by the Scottish Government right at the start of a pandemic. So that's just about to be rolled out. That's, um, that's really our top story today and that's excellent news. Uh, thank you for that update, Mirella. We're going to move on now from something very serious to something pretty trivial. Um, Christmas fun and games. Who doesn't want to relax and have a, a quiz show at this time of year? Um, you may have heard Prime Minister Johnson, it now turns out, uh, took part in a quiz show last year which uh, confused me because this was one that he did remotely for a Downing Street staff party um, because I'd heard the week before that the, there wasn't a Downing Street uh, staff party or maybe there was and then towards the end of last week we reported that uh, it looks like there was a Downing Street staff party but the Prime Minister was shocked when he heard about it. Um, what confuses me is that uh, we hear from the weekend news that the Prime Minister actually took part in a quiz uh, and he wasn't actually there, but he was online uh, as a quiz master. He, he has um, experience uh, with, uh, with quizzes, of course. Um, so f let's go to Kirkub Stewart about this. So there's been a slow drip, hasn't there, Kirkub, of information about the party. Did it happen? Did it not happen? Yes, it did happen. Were the rules followed? Uh, yes, no, they weren't. Uh, did the Prime Minister know anything about it? No, he didn't. Well, actually, he was running the quiz. So uh, my question to you, Kirkub, um, is the Prime Minister now the weakest link? <laughs> well, that's one way of putting at it. Um, I mean, to be honest, I don't know why I'm laughing because this is actually, it's quite uh, serious um, for so many families. Um, and I've had people in touch with me who are just absolutely devastated at the level of hypocrisy um, and, dare I say it, corruption and cover-up um, that seems to be going on. And, you know, at this time in particular, and for the last sort of couple of years, 18 months, the, the serious leadership that has been required, and that leadership has asked the population to curb um, all of our natural instincts of wanting to socialize, of wanting to connect with our families, um, to save our loved ones. And unfortunately, and very sadly, uh, so many people have died and uh, the families that are, you know, trying to recover from that, will they ever recover? And then Boris Johnson, who has asked the population to do this, appears to have been flouting those rules himself. Um, I mean, we have a history of that, of course, with Dominic Cumming as well. 
um, come up with an answer. And then to me, they come up with an answer that barely gets them by until the next revelation, until the next revelation. So, you know, a bit of honesty, a bit of owning up and saying, do you know what, um, this is what happened. We're sorry, we apologize, it was unacceptable, but they just can't seem to do that. And Boris just seems to go on limping from one uh, mistruth or lie, whatever you want to call it, to another. Um, so we, we cannot help but seriously call into question his judgment and his leadership skills. Um, and I would go as far as saying that, you know, if this has been a test of leadership, um, and how we've tried to conduct ourselves through it. Is this uh, a government that we want to be tied to in Scotland? And I would argue that we wouldn't, um, that as an independent nation, we have a different set of values here um, and a, a different ethos. And that, that is worth protecting. Uh, yes, without being biased about it at all, there definitely is a different way of approaching the, the COVID uh, crisis between the Scottish government and the UK government, let's put it that way, a different, um, a different tone, if you like. Uh, people often comment on the seriousness of um, Prim, uh, First Minister Sturgeon's tone compared to the, the kind of jovial, um, you know, less serious attitude of the UK Prime Minister. Now, Marella, I wonder if you think, uh, as a clinician, is there an important part here of the message for public compliance with the COVID measures? Do you think it's important that people have trust in the leadership, trust in the, the people in charge that Cockup was talking about? Yeah, thanks for the, for the question. I should just say that I'm not a clinician. I'm a discovery scientist, but working in, obviously, um, in, in COVID and um, public health in, in general. I think it's incredibly important. And I was absolutely... I, you know, it's abysmal what's been going on, and it's no laughing matter whatsoever. Um, yesterday, I was I was heartbroken re uh, reading a story from a colleague of mine, uh, Corey Black, who published um, her story in Press and Journal actually about what was happening last Christmas. So as as they were having these parties in Number Ten and telling us what we can and cannot do. Uh, she walked her husband to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary because he had terminal, he was terminally ill and had to leave him by himself to go into the hospital because she couldn't accompany him, which is understandable, and she understood that. She wrote about sitting in the hospital car park in the car just to feel that she's closer to him. And of, obviously, this is what needed to be done. And then at the same time, you have a whole bunch of people that are telling us what we should be doing, and then doing this this is just absolutely unacceptable behavior um, and one thing that is really important is you know this is ruined it now for for public health message i was listening to the radio this morning as, as i got up of these young individuals going around soho being asked are you going to have parties and christmas and they said oh, of course we are because if downing street can do it why wouldn't we do it um, and i think it's really important to reiterate that you know we need to we need to be careful we need to uh, you know be sensible about how we approach our um everyday life and just because this has happened we should continue to to take those boosters take the vaccines do lateral flow tests before we have smaller family gatherings uh, as we go towards christmas and it, it, it is it is absolutely terrible what's been going on and it, an apology would be good but it's actually not good enough i think you know in, in a normal society um people need to go okay and on that point i noticed cock up that uh, once again in blackford the snp leader in westminster has said there's only one thing prime minister johnson should do now and that's resign well i don't suppose he's going to do that um unless the Conservatives lose a by-election next week on Thursday. I know you're not in the Westminster Parliament, but the polls are moving against uh, the, the Conservatives in England. I mean, they were never particularly for Conservatives in Scotland. Uh, do you think maybe English people are beginning to have had enough of the, of the jokes from Prime Minister Johnson? Yeah, I think so. I think that Boris has sort of traded on that from what I can see, you know, put across that kind of jovial buffoonery, um, make a joke of it. I mean, certainly, you know, he, 
he's sort of like insulted many, many people calling them all sorts of things, letterboxes. I remember that one particularly uh, well. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, I think that people have had enough of it. It's a hypocrisy. Um, when people have made sacrifices and they're continuing to be asked to be making those sacrifices, and then they're seeing a government that's being led by somebody who's clearly flouting them. And he clearly thinks that he's an exceptional uh, person and he's an exception. He is neither um, of those things. And leading by example at times like this is incredibly hard. I get that. Um, for all of us politicians, you know, um, we're going into, um, at the moment, uh, the guidance may change. We're waiting for information from the Scottish Parliament. Um, but we're doing uh, lateral flows and we've been encouraged to do them every single day. I've had to cut down on seeing constituents face to face who have a right to see me. Um, and we've put those online or limited those. So even myself, who's not been able to help people, and there is somebody who is having social gatherings, social occasions, and then lying and covering up about them. Um, so that undermines public confidence. And I hope that, um, you know, the people that vote for Boris Johnson um, down in England, um, they it's good that they're starting to actually step back and look at this and say, this is not a credible leader. This is not somebody we can have trust and faith in. Uh, now, the by-election that you referred to, I know that, I don't know the exact numbers, but the, there was um, a very healthy uh, majority there. And originally, when the by-election came about, they thought that that was going to be a safe seat. Um, well, I think that they're probably not thinking that it's a safe seat anymore and possibly the damage that has been done may well um you know affect that result uh which you know should sort of like give a very clear message to this conservative government that I, again i would say that they are not exceptions and they are not exceptional in what they can do they cannot continue with this hypocrisy and this corruption and this sort of sleaze really um i mean frankly it's it's taking the public for a ride really isn't it when we're all feeling at our most vulnerable um and when we need the strongest leadership this is what we get it is totally unacceptable well, let's find out on uh, Thursday whether the voters of North Shropshire see it that way. So we'll report on that, of course, on Friday when the results come through. Now, still dealing with UK politics, this week saw the passage in the House of Commons of the Borders and Nationality Bill. Now, among other things, this, this bill, if it becomes law, gives the government the right to take away your citizen, citizenship so any foreign-born UK citizen can actually have the citizenship taken away from them. That's if this bill becomes law. It's making its progress through the House of Commons and now goes to the House of Lords. Now, to, to underline the background to this bill, it's, it's, it really fits into the context of um, Theresa May and David Cameron's government when they brought in the... Um, the hostile environment idea, the, the, the idea uh, also including the Windrush generation of people who've been invited to the country from the Caribbean and saying, well, if you haven't got papers, how can you prove you're a citizen? And ultimately, people have been put on a plane and sent back to a place where they, they haven't been for 50 years. But the, potentially, the new act could, in fact, threaten five and a half million people in England and Wales who were born outside of the UK, and some even were born here. In fact, there's 400,000 people who were born in the UK who could potentially have the citizenship taken away from them. Now, I want to turn to Marella for this one. I used to work in the university myself, Marella, and I know that um, when people are looking for new colleagues, people are recruiting for a new post, they look at your CV, they look at what you can offer to the team. They don't ask where you come from. They don't want to see your passport, first of all. So universities thrive through having international teams, don't they? So are you aware, yourself and through other colleagues, of is there a feeling that um, people are not wanted here? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you can tell by my name and my surname that I wasn't born in this country. 
So I came here at the age of 17. Um, I feel that I have seriously contributed to the economy of, of Scotland and the economy of the UK. I've educated so many students at the university. Yet, when you think about it, this bill would be affecting people like myself. I'm not British born, therefore my citizenship could be taken away. Um, the same with my husband. I mean, he's British born, but his parents came from India. So what does that mean for all of us? And how does that make you feel? As you said, universities, um, and not just universities, businesses in general, have always been recruiting kind of top talent because it's really good to have diversity from all over the world. And we were severely affected, I have to say, by Brexit. So in the past, any time I had a vacancy for a studentship or, a, or any kind of um, opportunity, I had so many applications from Europe. And I'll tell you, the last two posts I had advertised, I had zero, zero applications from Europe. People don't feel welcome, so they don't come. Likewise, if you're from anywhere around the world, what does this bill tell you? I really hope that this is going to go nowhere because it's absolutely disgusting. Well, will it proceed or not? Of course, annoyingly, Cockhub, we can't really do anything about it. You have done what you can. So this week, the Guardian reported, in fact, that you and altogether about 40 members of the Scottish Parliament wrote an open letter to Priti Patel, uh, really condemning the measures in the new bill and also saying that it's not really all that popular. You made the point in that letter, you and the other MSPs, that public opinion is beginning to um, see it from, the, if you like, the refugees' point of view, whereas the UK government seems to be trying, well, they are criminalising refugees, aren't they? That's what, is, that, is that a fair way of putting it? I, th I think that is very fair, Hugh. Um, I certainly see it as uh, an anti-refugee bill, um, definitely. Um, and I, I was struck by what Mirella was saying um, about this sort of hostile environment. Uh, I saw the rise of that sort of happening in the 80s. Um, I'm also an immigrant. I wasn't actually born um, in uh, the UK or Scotland myself. Um, and as Mirella has said, uh, you know, we have a lot to offer and 30 years as a teacher, I've lost count of the amount of children that I've actually taught. Um, and now I'm in that privileged position that I'm helping much more. And it's people like myself, people like Marella and countless other hundreds of thousands of people that are affected by this. Um, and we're also in a, a situation where we have a skills shortage. And in Scotland, um, our population as well, um, is, you know, we, we need more people and we have the space for more people. We are a welcoming country. We do not have um, rights over immigration. So as a first thing, I would be wanting um, immigration to be devolved to Scotland so that we can actually take a human rights based approach to immigration um, and put humanity and dignity at the heart of it instead of criminalizing people who are uh, fleeing um, dreadful life-threatening conditions and then they're getting penalized again and again uh, the other thing that always strikes me is the amount of money that the uk government is putting into policing of borders if you took all of that money and actually invested in a system that uh, was quick that was fair that actually was able to process those seeking asylum and wanting to immigrate into this country i would say that you would have a much better a healthier attitude to that. People could get processed quickly, they would be able to work, they would be able to contribute, pay their taxes, um, you know, do all of that, be active citizens, which is what they want to be. They would not have to then be at the mercy of unscrupulous um, people who are trying to traffic them uh, basically across borders and these uh, illegal routes where women and children um, and men are suffering uh, horrendous journeys to escape persecution and we are then dehumanizing them even further to do that um, I, it is hugely hugely concerning this veering towards this sort of like you know right-wing agenda that is anti-immigrant 
um, that is anti-refugee, anti-asylum seeker, and I would say, you know, in contravention of uh, human rights um, as well on that. I'm just absolutely appalled, which is why I, along with, um, you know, so many of my other colleagues from the Scottish Parliament, um, put our name to that letter. Yes, thank you. So it is actually a human rights question, and we reported the other day that it was United Nations Human Rights Day. Now, of course, the UK is a signatory to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and we also are a signatory to, to um, the law on refugees. So um, it looks like Britain has been turning its back on that. Uh, but let me move on from there to one other aspect of your letter, uh, which, remember, 40 MSPs wrote the letter to Priti Patel asking her to think again about the Border and Nationality Act. I noticed on the, the list uh, from Glasgow, Paul Sweeney's name appeared there, and also looking through it, Anna Sabar, Scottish Labour leader, and Monica Lennon, and several others. Uh, pro, pro, I didn't actually look at the whole list, but uh, obviously the Scottish Labour people were quite happy to be on that letter, and so was Ross Greer. I noticed his name of from the Scottish Green Party. So there's at least three parties on that letter. Now, do you think that's important, Cobb, that it wasn't an SNP letter? It was actually from uh, the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, I, I do think that it was very, very important. Um, you know, I mean, party politics is important, but when it comes to human rights, um, I think that it's essential that we take a cross-party approach to this and, um, you know, be united against uh, this... Tory government's hostile agenda, which just seems to be going on and on. Um, and I'm hoping that because it is a cross-party approach, that will carry more weight behind it um, as well, that we're all united on this. Because um, believe it or not, you know, although we have our uh, debates, which are very robust in the parliament, um, there are areas that uh, we actually agree on. and. Personally, this is my personal opinion, I don't think that any right-minded person um, could disagree with the fact that this is a very draconian, dehumanising, um, absolutely anti-immigration uh, UK borders bill, which, as I said, I hope, and I agree with Mirella on this, is that I hope that it does go nowhere. Um, but I am very mindful that... Um, you know, Priti Patel uh, is not known for listening, um, but hopefully she will pay attention to this. Well, we'll just have to see what develops. It'll be in the House of Lords next before it goes back to Parliament, uh, back to um, the Commons, where, of course, the Conservatives have an 80-seat majority. So we'll see if uh, this time anyone is listening. Um, OK, thank you. Let's move on now. I'm going to discuss another aspect of the Scottish budget, of course, Kate Forbes, Cabinet Secretary for Finance read out the Scottish Budget to Parliament on Thursday, but um, quite a lot of the detail only emerges later on. So today, briefly, I'd like to look at one other aspect of it, which is the green measures which have been included in the budget. Full details are on the Scottish Government's website. But I'm going to turn to Marella, first of all, about the North East. If you move out of your your comfort zone, and uh, let me just categorise you properly, Marella, so I wrongly um, described your CV. You're actually a research scientist working in diabetic medicine. But I'm going to ask you about green jobs in a minute because uh, included in the budget was 20 million as a start to move towards the green transition. So this is the idea that over a long period of time, maybe something like 10 years, uh, jobs will be gradually migrating out of our oil and gas sector and into the new green sectors. Um, so in your opinion from a citizen of the uh, north east of Scotland, um, are people willing to embrace the idea that Aberdeen could move beyond oil and gas? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question and the answer would be absolutely. So Aberdeen for the past several years has been working towards kind of moving away from just oil and gas, starting off with decommissioning work and now kind of moving towards being the center for net zero solutions. So just as you just said, there was an announcement of just transition fund or energy transition fund and about 20 million will be for those projects. And the projects would be identified that would be impacted by the transition in the Northeast specifically because our economy in the past has really heavily uh, depended on oil and gas and this is much needed incentive from the Scottish government to allow us to move to the, that transition. Um, there's also a 53 million um, uh, budgetary uh, uh, 
uh, promise for a larger scale kind of industrial decarbonization projects. And 20 of this includes the energy transition fund uh, in the Northeast, which is really, really important for us. Uh, so I think kind of um, for Aberdeen, this is really crucial investment that we have required. And we have been positioning ourselves for the past few years to be able to deliver on those net zero solutions. So it's, it's really good news. Well, that's good to hear because um, I'm going to turn to cock up and ask about the politics of it because all, I guess in politics people have to make their ground, have to say this is where we stand and if you want to vote for us, this is our position and you have to distinguish, distinguish yourself and carve out your own bit of the political marketplace if you like. I'm sorry, I used to lecture business studies. I tend to uh, think of things in that way. Um, but it looks like the Conservatives are definitely carving out their ground. Is that going to be a, a big... They're saying, we are the party of oil jobs, right? Vote, with, vote Conservative to stay in the 1970s, right? Do you think there's any mileage of that in, the, in that for the Conservatives, Kukub? Um, I don't... I can, I can see why they're doing that, um, and I don't blame them, because that's historically, you know, um, where they've come from. And also, historically, um, Scotland has... Uh, relied on oil, uh, coal in the past. Uh, so all, all of these, you know, industries have been there. However, I think, um, you know, and I'm in Glasgow Kelvin, we uh, had COP26 uh, here uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and I was able to attend on uh, one day um, and speak to many, many people uh, about the just transition. And I think that that's the key of it. Uh, I can understand that people will be very nervous about their jobs. Um, but what we also need to do is to push ourselves out of that comfort zone and um, the status quo is not acceptable. Um, we know this because of climate change and the impact um, of that. We're heading, you know, we want to aim towards net zero. So a change is going to have to occur and that requires the change of mindset. So the Just Transition Fund, um, which you were talking about, the 20 million uh, that's already been released, and that's of course part of the 500 million over a 10 year period. So it's good to see that initial funding being released. Um, I come at it from a, a sort of very passionate, but a slightly different angle from the education point of view. So I think that there's an enormous opportunity for education here about uh, upskilling and reskilling uh, people. I have a lot of contact with the uh, um, colleges and universities, um, that many of whom are uh, based in Kelvin, and they're seeing this as a real opportunity. Uh, you know, with research and development um, in uh, technologies of the future, uh, of decarbonisation, um, looking at harnessing. You know, even there was a company that. Um, that's actually based in Kelvin Catrick uh, that are looking at smaller units that harness uh, wind power. So instead of having the big, uh, you know, the big wind farms, these are smaller units that can be put together. So there's lots of innovation there. And where there's innovation, there's opportunities for jobs. There's opportunities for research and development. So I think moving forward, we have no choice. We, we have to do that. And I think it's only right and correct that the Scottish government are uh, investing in that just transition because it's not going to happen overnight. This is, you know, going to take um, a while, um, too long for some people, um, and I totally get that. Um, but it is thinking differently, knowing we cannot continue the way that we are doing at the moment, and seeing it as an opportunity. And I understand that's difficult, but by providing the right support. Um, the right educational opportunities and the correct package of funding, I do believe that we can make uh, huge progress in this area. And it is a transition. And as I said before, it's not expected to be overnight. You know, people who work in the rig aren't going to lose a job next week. We're, we're talking about, I think, something like 10 years at least. And various targets are like 2035 or 2040. So, uh, yeah, it's the beginning of a transition. And that's going to be a slow transition instead of just saying, so everybody, here's your P45. But, and a lot of those jobs can transfer, particularly with the off-sea jobs. A lot of the skills can transfer. Um, so I will... Well, we'll watch that as it develops. I think uh, we're, we're at the beginning, as you said, Marilla, that's 20,000 uh, to start off this process. One th 
final thing before we move on to the next story on the budget that uh, caught my eye is the, the suggestion that we should have targets to reduce something. In particular, uh, kilometres travelled by car. It's, um, this struck out, struck out to, at me. Um, by 2030, the Scottish Government hopes to have 20% fewer kilometres travelled by, uh, by car. And I thought that's interesting. You don't very often see governments looking at something which is economic, if you like, eco economic activity, you know, burning gasoline, uh, making vehicles, and now we're publishing a target to have less of it. I'm just wondering for both of you, if this is uh, maybe the start of um, a new way of counting the economy, instead of counting what's growing, let's count something that's not growing. Is that a better idea? What do you think of that, Marella? I missed that in the bill, so I don't know, but I, I, I think that's quite interesting. I mean, I, I'm a massive supporter of travelling by train. Anytime I go to London, I go on train. So so for me, I'm kind of using more public transport rather than using your private cars. Is a, it just makes sense. So that, that's about as far as I can comment on this one. Okay, well, more is less is really what I'm saying, Cooker. But there's also <laughs> yes, been a, yeah. a... for yeah, some time. I quite like it. I, I, I was just one thing. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I quite like that idea um, because, you know, we, well, we are looking at reductions in lots of things. We want to reduce emissions. Um, so, you know, uh, we want to reduce that impact on the planet, um, the negative impacts, obviously. So reducing our car miles, um, you know, fits in with that. I think that it's realistic because, um, again, you know, people uh, do use the cars. Many use them for very good reasons. For instance, in rural areas, it's much more difficult for people to uh, be jumping onto public transport. So whilst the infrastructure um, works on, um, you know, providing more extensive uh, rail, um, providing better bus services, um, again, during that transition time, people are going to be using their cars. But if they're using them less, then to recognize that that is actually working towards something. So it's like working in sort of like we bite-sized steps. And also what's quite nice is, you know, I mean, obviously I'm representing the SNP and whilst I think that our um, green credentials in that sense um, are very healthy, uh, I think this is a good um, example of where the uh, cooperation agreement with the Greens is actually pushing uh, the Scottish Government as a whole um, to be more uh, creative um, in the way that we're asking people to change their behaviours, which is ultimately what this is about, um, you know, is changing of behaviours incrementally making that transition to ultimately um, having fewer cars on the road um, eventually. Yep, yes, it's not just industry and the government has to make the, the transition, maybe ourselves, the population have to begin thinking about uh, different ways of living. Um, on the subject of uh, climate change, I'm going to briefly go over the, um, the devastating news about the tornadoes which hit the Midwest of America. Uh, the other day, and um, the, the the complexity of this tornado system is quite um, unprecedented. What I mean is there were several different tornadoes, and uh, one U.S. source is talking about the quad state to four state tornado. This is extremely unusual that tornadoes went through four states, uh, and another one, the big one, which devastated the town of Mayfield, that's in Kentucky, I think was measured at 230 miles long. As I understand it, these they talk about the, container, the tornado hitting the ground. It starts off with turbulence in the air, it descends, and that's when it becomes a tornado, and it travels. And this one travelled 230 miles, and they reckon that's the biggest anyone has ever heard of. The other thing is it's extremely unlikely that you get tornadoes in December. So there's a lot of weird stuff happening in the weather. Um, have you ever experienced a tornado? I don't think we get them very much in Europe, uh, Marella. Do you know anything about these? I think that I think there have been some more recently in Europe. But, I mean, this one was just devastating. I saw that on the news last night. Uh, that candle factory, which basically has been completely swept away with all the workers that have been working overtime in it, 
gone basically but um i was trying to read up on it and apparently you know this again there is no direct evidence as always but climate change could be closely linked to this because tornado season is not now it's normally early spring so in may march april yes but not in december and it's associated with warm weather so quite high, high temperatures in the middle of of the winter um it's it's just absolutely awful and it's it's interesting there's six states and these are not kind of the usual states that you would normally get tornadoes and so again kind of following on from cop 26 i think you know a lot more will need to be done to understand these changes and how we cope with these so uh, you can't of course say that any one event was caused by climate change but the, as you said Marilla, if there's more temperature in the atmosphere my basic understanding is more yeah. temperature means more energy therefore more violent storms when you get them so that that certainly looks like um, an example of it would you agree cock up is this just the sort of thing we can expect to see more of if you don't keep climate change down to 1.5 well that was my initial response as well um and and i agree i, I don't want to sort of come across as having a simplistic sort of um understanding although it probably is because you know i don't come from um a scientific or uh sort of meteorological background but to me there does seem to be more and more incidents of unusual uh weather phenomena that are occurring um and on the one hand you know I, I do believe that we are sort of like moving towards uh dealing with uh climate change um i think that we could be doing more on a global level um definitely um during COP26, I was able to speak to some delegates from uh, Malawi uh, and they were talking um, about the effects of extreme drought um, and extreme flooding that they are actually having to deal with right now um and how that has an impact on um even on women and girls in particular because uh they're having to give up their education uh just in order to get water um and spending hours doing that which then has a knock-on effect on the the village um and the macro um economies of that but also life just becomes about survival rather than thriving so they're always on the back foot um and it was it was heartbreaking to hear those stories so from a certain extent you know i'm talking about recycling and reducing my plastic um things that are pushing me a wee bit out of my comfort zone but then i'm hearing about people across the world that are living with the devastating effects of climate change right now um not least because of extreme weather Yes, it's um, it's not just in the future, it is happening al already. Um, now let's move on, our final story tonight, we're going, is it, sorry, this afternoon, um, we're going to look at the European Film Awards, and one of the awards went to the film Quo Vadis Aida uh, by Jasmila Zbanich, and uh, the film stars, uh, the film focuses on the character Aida, who's been displaced by the Bosnian War, we're looking back at the situation around Srebrenica just before the peace agreement of 1995. Now, none of us here has seen the film, but we're looking forward to it. We certainly hope this this makes its way to Glasgow. Um, so we're taking it... Uh, well, listen, let's just go over to Mirella. Do you know anything ab about the, the film and uh, the career of uh, yeah, Jasmine Zbanich? Yeah, I haven't seen the movie as yet, and I'm, I'm looking forward, as you say, to seeing it. But I think it's really important. One of the things I should say, this movie, as far as I know, was also nominated for the Oscars. And um, in the European Awards, won three different categories. So Yasmina Zbanic got the best director, but he also won the best European movie. And the, the actress, the lead actress, also got the best actress award. So it really is quite amazing. And it kind of takes us back to the you know, to the darkest hour in Bosnian history from the um, war in 1995 of, of uh, genocide in Srebrenica, where 8,000 men and boys were murdered uh, by Bosnian Serbs, uh, something that is still denied by some uh, individuals. 
and it really kind of brings the story from from my reading of it of of you know so Aida is uh, an interpreter in the story she's a, a English teacher who starts working as a translator in the in the UN camp so the Dutch um, uh, envoy that was there uh, and I'm sure some viewers today will remember that the, all the people fled towards the UN safe haven to try and get protection from the Serbian army. Um, however, the UN, the UN forces are really kind of in their minority and had shut the gates in effect. So it's a story. She doesn't apparently show any graphic um, kind of bloodshed, but it's the story of, of her knowing all this information that there's not much they can do to help and trying to work out how she can maybe save her husband and her son from this, but also help others. Um, so it's it's a powerful story, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this because you know I don't know how much the viewers are aware of what's going on in Bosnia at the moment politically, but the situation is really dire again. Um, and you know, Srebrenica mothers still haven't seen you know justice and haven't found the bones of their children. So this is a really powerful story for all of us in Europe to remind us of what has been going on and to remind us that we mustn't allow this to happen again. So I'm really, really pleased that this was recognized by the European and you know, international movies. Yes, we did cover the, the story in the, the, the Republic of Serbsa Parliament last uh, Friday, began the process of really breaking up Bosnia. In yeah. fact, they're going to start creating a Serbian army. So you're going to have one country, Bosnia, that will have two armies in it. One Bosnia Croat <laughs> official army and a Serbian army. That sounds like a, but the worst news I've heard all week. Uh, just briefly, because we're running short of time, Kokab, do you think there's anything we in Scotland could do to maybe appeal to the forces maybe within Serbian politics? Because obviously they're not all uh, crazy nationalists, uh, the gun tossing. We saw in the parliament last week, Serbians who had taken part in the war were saying, let's stop this move towards secession. That's not going to end in a good place. Is there anything we can do to encourage the, the more peaceful voices in, in the Serbian side? Well, I would like to think so. Um, you know, any kind of sort of like um, diplomatic um, international negotiations and things that I think are really, really important. Um, and the role of peacekeeping as well, um, providing uh, that support and guidance and encouragement in order to do that. Um, I mean, I, I remember um, in, you know, in and around 1995 and the ethnic cleansing of Muslims that was going on was absolutely heartbreaking. Um, and I just think that having films like this with this kind of content um, and telling that story um, is so important to remind us of the atrocities um, that have happened um, and people are living with those still. But also, more importantly, for us to be ever vigilant and mindful so that we don't allow those um, atrocities to happen again and again. Um, and this kind of film coming out uh, raises awareness of that again. It brings it back to the fore uh, so that politicians can, but also the general public as well, can build up a head of steam on that and put pressure on the relevant authorities to actually uh, find a better way um, that, you know, yeah, it's just, it was just horrific. Um, I suppose coming from a Muslim background myself, um, I, I did feel it very personally at the time, um, and I do, but I protect the right of every, you know, religious and uh, ethnic minority, um, sort of like race and people to survive and to thrive. Um, so it's a very important message from this film. And I'm really pleased that it's won so many awards because, again, that should help to, for its distribution. Um, you know, not that it, mm -hmm. yeah, a good film yep. should be able to stand alone anyway, but the fact that it's attracted so much attention um, because of its awards, hopefully it will get distributed and seen by as many people as possible. Well, let's hope it comes here. Yes, so um, that's the film Quo Vadis Aida. 
by just merely Zubanic and um, if it comes to Glasgow or anywhere else in Scotland we'll certainly let you know. Well we're just about out of time now so thank you to Cockham Stewart MSP joining us from the west end of Glasgow and to Professor Morella Delabegovic in Aberdeen thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's been a lot of important uh, stuff to, to discuss today and I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to some of these topics as they roll out. So finally let me just thank you all for watching uh, Full Scottish today and if you'd like to help us make more programmes and extend the range of our activities please look at the, li the link on there if you're one of our subscribers already it's really great to have you on board and if not please uh, consider going onto the website and subscribing the more money we get and the more programmes we'll make. Uh, so that's it from me today uh, so uh, we'll be back again tomorrow evening so see you later bye now <laughs>